volatilities, correlations and so on. And we've just added a page to it where we calculate sort of our measure of systemic risk of top 100 financial firms in the United States as of now. It's updated on a daily basis based on new market information that becomes available. Uh, and we are in the process of actually internationalizing it. So uh, hopefully in the next six months, we'll also be providing our systemic risk measure for uh, European and Australasian <coughs> financial firms. So uh, I'm, I'll probably talk a little bit about the measure, not in its full glory, but uh, I thought I'll talk a little bit more broadly about systemic risk rather than just in the context of the specific measure that we use. Of course, I will advertise it at, uh, at some point. And uh, uh, some of these uh, comments are based on actually uh, a, a session that was held at the Board of Governors. Uh, they'd asked me uh, and some others a very specific set of questions. I prepared some responses. And I'm just sort of relaying those answers because I think it's a nice uh, way of uh, setting the stage for the so of course, uh, maybe we should start out by, I'm going to start out by just being very precise about what I mean by systemic risk. Uh, so we're going to interpret systemic risk as <laughs> widespread failure of financial institutions or freezing of capital markets that can impair financial intermediation. So payment systems, lending to corporations, household. Uh, and we're going to take a very specific stand that it emerges when the financial sector has too little capital to cover its liabilities. Okay, so in our mind, systemic <coughs> risk is, is not the actual systemic event when it all blows up, but it's the risk that that event may happen. And we think that this event is more <coughs> likely to happen when the financial sector has too little capital uh, to cover its liabilities. So uh, 2008 fall is perhaps maybe the best illustration of this. Uh, we did witness collapse of a, of a large number of institutions all at once. Uh, it did lead to freezing up of capital markets and interbank markets and so on. Uh, and it led to a large uh, amount of losses, whichever way you look at it, falls in market caps, contractions of GDP, collapse of international trade, uh, etc. Et uh, of course, Besides these immediate costs, one reason why you might worry about uh, these kinds of systemic crises is because invariably these are the times when you need a lot more regulatory and government interventions. Uh, you know, they might have their own set of uh, distortions or moral hazard issues associated with it. And so to the extent that they put the economies in, a, in pretty vulnerable positions, uh, these states seem to be uh, at least worth thinking about and avoiding uh, if, if, if one can avoid them at a reasonable cost. Now, uh, a usual question that arises is, but what I just described, isn't that just systematic risk? Uh, isn't it possible that a large number of industrial firms collapse all at once? Uh, and shouldn't we think about that as uh, systemic risk? Uh, so one reason is, of course, we. it seems that when industrials uh, fail together, so let's say an entire industry gets into trouble at once. It actually happens all the time, even outside of recessions. Uh, it doesn't seem to endanger the payment system or credit uh, cycle, <laughs> credit transmission in the economy and so on. Uh, but I think even within the context of financial firms, uh, I think there's an important difference between systemic and systematic risk. So let's think about uh, Fidelity. Uh, it has a very large market index fund. Uh, now, that fund has a lot of systematic risk. Okay? <laughs> its, its value is just going to fluctuate up and down uh, with market conditions. But we don't think that this risk is necessarily systemic because this fund, for all practical purposes, has no leverage built in it. So, you know, it's, it's, it has invested $1 in the market and that's exactly the amount of equity that the investors in the fund have actually put in. There's sort of no uh, leverage built in other than the fact that there are some redemption rights. So I can go in and withdraw whenever I want. And if a lot of us withdraw all at once, it's possible that Fidelity's liquidations might move the market a little bit. That may have some temporary illiquidity effects, but there's no tremendous leverage built into this position. In contrast, let's think about a scenario in which you have a uh, investment bank or a bank that's levered, say, 25 is to 1, 
And inside that bank, it's actually running uh, an asset management vehicle that looks like an index management fund. Okay, it looks like an index <coughs> fund. Uh, so you could have a trader inside uh, the firm or a group inside this bank, which takes one dollar, but then through whichever way, it takes a 25 is to one bet on the market on basis of it. Now, a 10% contraction in the market is going to only produce a 10% loss of capitalization on the uh, Fidelity's market index fund. But if that was inside a leveraged institution, and if it had been levered, position had been levered 25 is to 1, that 10% market drop is going to produce a much larger drop in equity value, okay? because it's levered 25 is to 1. So we think that systemic risk is inherently about leverage. Uh, but it is, of course, about ag aggregate risk or systematic risk also, because without that, you wouldn't really get a large number of institutions affected all at once. But we think it's the combination of systematic risk and leverage which is key to contributing systemic risk. Another example is, in terms of just destruction of household wealth or loss of household wealth, the Nasdaq crash was of the order of a trillion and a half dollars which is almost the same magnitude as the house price shock that households have witnessed. Uh, but NASDAQ uh, boom, for large part, was not um, uh, financed through extremely high levels of leverage. There was probably some margin-based equity investments, but nowhere on the scale of leverage that we saw in the housing boom. So we think uh, it, did, it was a big shock. We did have a recession, uh, but it wasn't a full-fledged financial crisis. It wasn't a great recession and we weren't even talking about it becoming a great depression. So we think leverage and systematic risk are both uh, important parts of this. So uh, so with this sort of notion of systemic risk, uh, one question that arises is, should you rely on market-based uh, indicators for systemic risk of institutions and of the financial sector, uh, or should we primarily rely on uh, sort of uh, regulatory supervision of the system as a whole. Um, uh, our view is that we, we should not really make a choice. Uh, you know, these are both valuable ways of generating information about financial sector. There's clearly uh, information that is accessible to regulators that markets don't have. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the beauty about markets is that there's lots of people generating information that all gets sort of aggregated into <coughs> prices. Uh, and it's useful to look at prices to just sort of uh, see if one is getting a coherent or consistent picture across the field. Um, also, we think that you do ultimately for regulation need to use some objective criteria as well besides subjective supervisory information uh, because uh, it's it just easier to use objective criteria in regulation if you had to charge a tax, for example, on systemic risk or impose a capital requirement that was tied on systemic risk, uh, it would be a lot easier to rely on objective information than say, oh no, our supervisor has found you to be extremely risky, so you need to hold more capital. Uh, you can use it, but then again, you need to uh, standardize the supervisory information up to a point where it seems objective. Um, so we've been doing some work on this of how to use market measures for systemic risk. Uh, we think it's, it should really be a complement to what regulators could do on their own, for example, through a stress test that was done uh, in spring of 2009. Okay, so uh, let me sort of just explain the basic idea behind our measure. So the basic idea behind our measure is somewhat along the lines of the stress test done by the Federal Reserve System uh, in the U.S. in spring of 2009. So let's say that this W1 is the aggregate uh, capitalization of the financial sector. And this W star is a level up to which we think the financial sector functions well. Okay, so let's say that this is 4% of assets or 8% of assets or something like that. Okay, that it's some benchmark for where we think up to this level of capitalization, intermediation will operate at efficient levels. And let's say that to the left of this point, uh, we deem the financial sector as uh, increasingly looking undercapitalized. So as we go further to the left, it looks more and more undercapitalized. And we assume, uh, sort of in a very straightforward way, that the greater is the undercapitalization relative to this threshold capitalization, 
the larger is the deadweight loss arising from loss of intermediation. Okay, so to just make this more concrete, so in the Federal Reserve stress tests, relative to a required capitalization of some say 4% tier 1 capital on bank balance sheets, they found that in one particular macroeconomic scenario that they looked at, the total undercapitalization of the financial sector was $75 billion. Okay, and our, our assessment is that if instead of 75, that had been say 150, uh, we would have been talking about twice as large a real cost to the economy from that happening. Now, why is this a useful way of thinking about it? Because now we are making precise what is the externality arising from systemic risk. Okay, so if Bank of America contributed $35 billion out of that $75 billion undercapitalization of the system, we are going to say that Bank of America's share of the real cost imposed by the financial firms due to their undercapitalization is basically linked to those $35 billion. Okay, and so that $35 billion becomes a measure for actually, in some sense, charging a capital requirement to Bank of America. So what is the, what is the overall scenario? The overall scenario is you shock the system to, uh, to a state where you think the financial sectors might get undercapitalized as a whole. So you have to ask the question, in that scenario, house price decline, GDP contraction, <coughs> etc., how much does Bank of America suffer? So it's your loss when the system as a whole is in trouble, and that becomes the measure of your systemic risk. Okay? How, so your capitalization loss is a measure of how much you are contributing to the real spillover to the economy in that state. And therefore, I now want to regulate you through a capital <laughs> requirement or a tax, etc. Uh, on basis of this. So now the question is, how do you measure this? So I just described <coughs> one way of measuring this, which is uh, really through a stress test. Another way of measuring it would be to try and see if some market measure could be used. Okay, so in our, uh, in our research, we've come up with this idea of a systemic expected shortfall. Which, is, which would be higher if that externality, the slope of that line in my graph, was more severe. It would be higher if the macroeconomic scenario was more likely. Uh, it would be larger for a bank that had a larger exposure in correlated assets, okay? because in a macroeconomic scenario, those are the assets which are going to get hit all at once. And it would be larger for a bank that has more leverage to start with because the macroeconomic scenario is going to produce an amplified undercapitalization of that particular firm. Okay, it's just, there's just <coughs> more leverage. So a 1% loss of asset value is going to produce a much larger equity loss for that particular firm. Okay, so, to just, uh, so as I said, we we have this sort of website where we produce a little bit of this. So our, the intuition, therefore, for our measure is very simple, which is that the kind of scenario that Federal Reserve looked at for the stress test was kind of like a Great Depression kind of scenario. But that doesn't happen in data on and off. But you do see, so that is like, in some sense, like the absolute tail of what you are likely to see, okay? That there's a 40% collapse in stock market and so on. Now, of course, you don't see that. If you were in one, uh, one year prior to the crisis, however, Whatever is the distribution in the one year prior to the crisis, you can still look at the worst days of that year and see which financial firms were actually losing their market cap the most. Okay? And then there's a little bit of extrapolation that if instead of 2% shock, I had a 40% shock to the market, it's the same firms that are actually going to lose the most. So, uh, so here are some demos. So what, what is this graph? So this graph is which banks lost how much of their market cap during the crisis. These are the top 100 financial firms, not just mm -hmm. banks. And here is a measure called MESS, or how much MESS they're going to create. <laughs> uh, so mar it's, it's a statistical measure called marginal expected shortfall, but it so happens that it's also a MESS. <laughs> so this is 5%. So in the year prior to the crisis, we asked the question, on the 5% worst days of the market, it's about 13 days, which financial firms were losing most of their market cap. Okay, so this number says that Lehman was losing about close to 3% of its market cap on the 5% worst days of the market in the year prior to the crisis. Bear Stearns was losing something greater than 
And now the question is, is there any relationship between what happened to them actually in the crisis from July 07 to December 08 and this pre-crisis measure? And uh, you get about 7 to 8 percent R squared and you pick up some of the most egregious ones. So Fannie Mae, Lehman, Bear Stearns, Merrill, Morgan Stanley, they are all here. But of course, a lot of underlevered firms also show up here. This is the problem I was mentioning earlier. These are all exchanges, NYMEX, uh, Intercontinental Exchange, and so on. So you also need to look at the leverage dimension, which is does leverage before the crisis also help you explain the performance in the crisis? And once you sort on these two measures together, you get up to about 30% R squared together. As you can see, on both leverage as well as exposure to correlated risks, the GSEs and the investment banks were actually most highly exposed even prior to the crisis. So I need to quickly wrap up. So you can do this with uh, CDS data as well. Uh, and let me just show one last uh, uh, evidence, which I think is perhaps interesting. So this is basically the outcome of the Federal Reserve stress tests. These were done for 19 bank holding companies. The mm -hmm. banks at the top <coughs> are the banks that ended up with a capital shortfall in Federal Reserve simulation of who's going to become undercapitalized. <coughs> the number I've been using, Bank of America, up close to $35 billion of shortfall. Now on the right, over here, I have their mess and the leverage computed as of Lehman Brothers collapse. Okay, so that's about six months prior to when the stress tests were conducted. And what you see here is that actually the banks that seemed okay in the Federal Reserve stress test and the banks that had the shortfall are actually almost well partitioned by their this measure mess, okay, which is in the one year prior to the conduct, conducting of the stress test on the worst days, who was losing the most. So this number says Bank of America was losing 15% of its market cap on the worst days of the crisis up to Lehman Brothers collapse. And indeed, these banks are the ones that also show up with a capital shortfall. And not surprisingly, these are also the banks with the highest leverage. Okay, so let me just sum up. So we think that market-based measures of leverage and of your correlated risks with the rest of the economy uh, are one potential way of looking at systemic risk. They are not everything, but they could give you some early warning indicators of who looks more vulnerable and you can do something about it, either tax them or charge them a higher capital requirement, for example. Thanks. Thanks. We're going to be uh, presenting some joint um, work with Wayne Passmore from the Fed. And as all Fed employees have to do, I'm going to give the standard disclaimer that these are our views and not those of the Federal Reserve System. So um, I'm going to start by um, actually looking at what our chairman has said about systemically important firms. And what he's argued is that they need to have capital standards and other supervisory tools that are calibrated to the systemic importance of the firm. And also that they should hold a greater share of their capital in the form of common equity or instruments with similar loss absorbing attributes, such as contingent capital <coughs> that converts to common equity when necessary to mitigate a systemic crisis. So I'm going to argue that we should think about a corrective action today. And uh, if we look back over the crisis, a uh, prompt corrective action <coughs> was designed to be hardwired and automatic for resolving troubled institutions. And various actions were supposed to be taken to improve the viability of a bank and reduce the cost of resolution. And these triggers were based on capitalization. But they didn't work. Uh, for systemic firms. Uh, the motivations behind PCA were good, but there were a number of things that were highlighted by the recent uh, financial crisis. First of all, PCA didn't apply to bank holding companies. That said, there were a large number of bank holding companies that had to be resolved that never really <coughs> were undercapitalized uh, the quarter end before the resolution. Examples would be Wachovia, uh, and uh, uh, women. Uh, in addition, regulatory capital ratios are very lagging indicators, or sometimes no indicators, of the financial condition of a bank holding company. And it's systemic firms 
that are likely to suffer a run before their capital threshold is crossed. So what we're going to focus today is on what are we going to do for prompt corrective action in terms of uh, systemically important firms. <coughs> Why we think prompt corrective action? Well, I already mentioned that it didn't work and we might make it more relevant. Uh, we also want to focus on these runs by wholesale investors and <coughs> we want to provide an analytical framework that is focused on the provision of credit. And we're going to investigate the usefulness of contingent capital as a method both to mitigate the runs, protect taxpayers, <coughs> and actually um, have a more stable uh, credit flow to the economy. And we're going to integrate all these ideas into the current discussion on financial regulation, Dodd-Frank <coughs> and Basel III. So our basic idea in a nutshell is what we call financial stability-based prompt corrective action. And it's a hierarchical <coughs> defense structure for mitigating systemic risks. And we're going to first start with common equity, which is going to be our first line of defense. Then we're going to have these contingent capital contracts with firm-specific or industry-specific term events that are going to be chosen for each systemically important firm as the second line of defense. And then the third line of defense is going to be something which we call a systemic trigger event. And that's going to convert all the hybrid capital instruments to common equity and bring all the contingent capital injections that haven't been triggered and possibly write down the subordinated debt instruments as our third line of defense. So when we think about how much capital is needed, under the Basel II framework, there's usually this probability density of losses. And there's this tail out in the um, end, and that's the part that um, is not going to be covered by capital. And then there's the expected losses, which are going to be, uh, of course, uh, covered by loan loss provisions and like. And then capital is one minus uh, this confidence interval. <coughs> Under Basel II, the bank supervisor maintain a fixed confidence interval, and this capital level is the first defense against insolvency. <coughs> For the second line of defense, we're going to argue contingent capital might be used, and these are these various contractual arrangements that are going to provide a pre-specified form and amount of capital conditional upon the realization of a trigger event. And it's kind of like privately provided form of tail risk insurance. And uh, Alan Greenspan has mentioned that <coughs> contingent capital has at least a reasonable chance of reversing the extraordinarily large moral hazard that has arisen in the recent uh, financial crisis. But to be able in the details, okay, uh, there are many different kinds of structures that can provide uh, contingent capital. And I just provide a short list here. Uh, we've had many investment banks come up with very creative different kinds of structures from principal write-down securities to fully collateralized uh, cash settled <coughs> insurance policies. Uh, you're probably aware of um, the mandatory reverse convertible debenture uh, that has been championed by Mark Flannery. Uh, but there's all kinds of different structures that could potentially be used. And I put some of the key considerations on the left there, such as its ability to absorb losses, uh, ex-ante market discipline, financial stability, and the like. And some of the key decisions or whether it's an on or off balance sheet structure, uh, if it converts from debt to equity, how many shares do the debt holders get, and whether uh, there's going to be dilution of uh, the shareholders. In addition, there's the question of what kind of trigger are you going to use? And those are equally uh, diverse. Uh, you know, people have talked about firm specific, like a stock price trigger, uh, you'd be using credit default swaps, um, various macro stability indices, 
And there's a lot of questions there, too, such as, <coughs> you know, does management have ability to control the trigger, market transparency, imperfect correlation to the actual problems of the firm? And there's a lot of uh, decisions there. Should it be market-based? Should it be have an override uh, by the primary uh, regulator? But one of the questions that people forget about is, you know, what losses is it that contingent capital are going to have to cover? And here, I've got kind of the loss distribution that I showed you earlier, but I've identified the adverse conditions or bottoms of the uh, cycle. And you can see that generally losses are higher during those periods. And the way that the fossil supervisors has chosen to look at it, is you can think of two distribution of losses, and you of course expect higher expected losses during a recession than during good times, and that contingent capital are going to hold that more uh, distant part. Uh, so you're still going to have that tail that's in the confidence uh, level, but contingent capital is going to kind of cover that slice. And they refer to this as the counter <coughs> Uh, capital uh, buffer. This is the amount you need for uh, the downturns because you're going to have higher uh, loss uh, estimates uh, during those time periods. So, uh, you know, was talking about his mess. Okay? <coughs> and uh, so what we've got here is the MES levels for 27 large bank holding companies and the two GSEs. And, uh, you know, what we've done is we've plotted them over time. And you'll see here that we have um, looked at the period from 2000 to 2006. And the mean is represented by this uh, dark black line. And the green line that goes across here is the two sigma event. <laughs> and the blue line is the three sigma event over the 2000-2006 uh, uh, period. If you use a three sigma trigger and you look at the first date that <coughs> each of the firms crosses the threshold <coughs> between 2007 and 2010, what you see is that Lehman Brothers would have crossed the threshold <coughs> in uh, February 2007, Bear Stearns also February 2007, and the firms that are highlighted in red here are the ones that needed capital under this gap. And the blue ones are the ones that didn't need capital. And of course, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would have been recapitalized in November of uh, 2007. So if this trigger had been used, then these firms could have been recapitalized uh, using the Kinton Capital prior to when Fannie and Freddie went down and also prior to the Lehman um, bankruptcy. So uh, when we back test using this MES uh, measure, what we see is that the <coughs> institutions would have been recapitalized at the top of the credit cycle rather <coughs> than at the bottom of the uh, credit cycle. And this <coughs> form of contingent capital would have better prepared the institutions for the downside of the credit cycle. It would have also been pretty attractive to the debt investors because they would have been able to get out, get stock, sell it, and uh, go and reinvest uh, their money. So it's less likely to have a debt spiral than the bottom of the cycle uh, kind of contingent capital that um, folks have talked about. And you can also use something like a cohort structure, which uh, has been championed by Panachi, Vermelli, and Wolf where the bond investor gets stock at a below market price, and the shareholders can buy it back from them at that price. So they're <coughs> coerced uh, so that they don't have uh, dilution. But is firm-specific contingent capital enough? Mervyn King has argued that the risks of banking can, and liquidity of funding can change suddenly uh, when market expectations shift. What looks like adequate capital one day is hopefully inadequate the next. And we know that capital is a very much a lagging indicator of financial firms. 
So in order to think about investors fleeing in anticipation that the capital will be ultimately depleted, you need to have some uh, way of recapitalizing uh, the banks. So um, there's a different, big difference between risk and uncertainty. Uh, in some circumstances, financial institutions may not be able to judge the riskiness of their investments. And risk applies to those situations where we can actually draw those probability distributions for losses that I showed you earlier in figures one and two. But uncertainty is where we can't know the information that is needed in order to figure out the actual cause in the first place. So figures one and two are not always applicable. So uh, for this sudden financial disruption, where panic arises, uncertainty pervasive, trust is breaking down, and investors, particularly those who <coughs> are guaranteed sensitive investors, are withdrawing uh, from their normal financial transactions, we <coughs> argue you're going to need more capital <coughs> in the financial system. Good firms, bad firms, they all are going to need more capital because the financial system is at risk. So in those uh, circumstances, what we need is some form of long tail risk insurance. And one potential is for the government to provide it. Another is for private investors to have to bail in before taxpayers. So the third line of defense is this idea of a systemic trigger. And this is where all the subordinated debt instruments, <coughs> about 4%, of risk-rated assets for banks, uh, their contingent capital contract that they haven't been triggered already, uh, any form of hybrid capital instrument that banks dream up, um, uh, also incorporate a systemic risk index. And this uh, systemic risk index is going to signal that a systemic crisis is underway. And when that's declared, everything turns into uh, capital. It's kind of like the 100-year flood, OK? It's not supposed to happen very frequently. And it's based on financial macroeconomic data. And this is not to protect idiosyncratic risk of the individual firm. So if you go down during a bad time, you don't get to trigger. Uh, this form of capital. Uh, we provide one form of systemic risk index. Uh, this one is actually based on uh, what subordinated <laughs> debt sensitivities are to unexpected shocks in various variables such as industrial production, treasury bill rates, and senior debt spreads <laughs> such as pulse pops, et cetera. And this one would have only triggered uh, once in um, the last 20 years. So we're going to use, we use a model. We looked at the competition between the banking and shadow banking sector. We looked at cost, availability, credit, and also financial stability. I'm not going to go through all the various uh, model results. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Uh, but I would like to point out the potential benefits of this hierarchical defense structure. First. It makes resolution more credible. Uh, the taxpayers are protected since debt to equity conversions, contingent capital infusions are likely to occur before resolution or public bailout um, occurs. Second, it improves financial stability because the backstop itself <coughs> provides greater financial stability because systemically important firms, or SIPIs as they're called, find that investors or insurance providers voluntarily uh, bail in for you know, an agreed on uh, price ex ante to improve the solvency of the firms. And it also reduces uh, contagion in the system because more capital is coming in as the firms become more systemically important. This also helps address the effects of a systemic crisis because if there's more capital in the financial system as a whole, 
it's going to reduce the need to engage in fire sales. So uh, we have an analysis of fire sales in our uh, paper. But what do the skeptics say? Well, might look make the funeral look a little different, but it's going to be a funeral anyway. Thank you. Um. Remarkably, what I have to say is sort of the low-tech version of what everybody else has said. So um, this, I think, will be easy enough to follow. Um, I rose to the challenge of trying to identify um, systemically important uh, institutions, although some people say that it's like the Supreme Court's definition of pornography. You know it when you see it, but it's kind of senseless to um, define it um, I think very highly of Gural's uh, approach statistically, but I guess I am more inclined to use a, a very pragmatic approach that is less um, dependent on current numbers. So I think there's some things we can say about systemic firms ex ante. First of all, though, I'd like to start with my view of what is an integrated um, financial system that actually can deal with systemically important firms. And it would include both supervision and um, capital regulation, and most importantly, the wind down function or the resolution function. Because I think you have to know <coughs> the end game before you can ever be sure of having market discipline in the system. So, unless you have a credible way of winding down even the most complicated firm in your system, you're really not going to have much market discipline taking place. Um, what I do have in mind um, an improved prompt corrective action, as we've heard about. And I do have in mind um, a contingent liability piece that was just talked about. It's slightly different, comes in much earlier, uh, and it's designed to uh, try to induce management to make uh, self-correcting moves before they're diluted. So dilution is actually a very big piece of, of my way of looking at it. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to focus mainly on wind-down plans, which, um, but let me start with my definition of systemic risk, which you'll see is very simple-minded compared to uh, the, the very fine work that Viral and his friends have been doing. Um, but I think ex ante, you can really identify probably 80% of the firms that you need to worry about by a very few criteria. One is the degree to which they're systemically important to the economy. That's pretty easy to figure out. What is their size relative to the economy? What is their complexity measured in numbers of affiliates? One of our largest firms has 2,435 majority-owned subsidiaries in more than 90 different countries. That's, by definition, a very <laughs> complex firm that is going to be difficult to deal with in a crisis. Uh, complexity is measured in terms of operational and financial independencies. If, for example, the firm clears half the sec government securities in the market or half the private securities in the market, it is, by definition, uh, systemic. Uh, the performance of systemically important functions, more or less the same thing. Uh, and then the number of regulatory agencies or courts that would have to approve the resolution of a group. Uh, and firms vary drastically with <coughs> regard to that. So that's some very um, ex ante, very commonsensical ways of identifying who you should worry about and who you shouldn't. And then I, I very much agree with Viral's assumption that um, what matters then is your vulnerability to a shock. So it's the amount of leverage that the group employs that's, given the other things, going to make you much more systemic <coughs> than the others. It's the vulnerability to a liquidity shock um, that uh, a firm has. It's the alignment between the subsidiary structure and the business structure. And one of the th things you find in many of these cases is there's virtually no alignment. And a huge amount of value was lost in the Lehman case because there were bits and pieces of viable businesses that went through bankruptcy courts in maybe 20 or 30 different countries and simply could not be um, retained. Um, so the better the alignment, the less systemic. And then the resolvability of the CIFI, as measured in, I'm mean, using CIFI in the same way that Diana did, systemically important financial institution. Um, the resolvability as measured in the time that um, officials believe it would take to resolve the institution. So notice there's a very heavy emphasis on resolution in the definition of systemic 
Um, and that's one of the key reasons that you want to integrate supervision and resolution. Because the data you need to identify a city and the data you need to gauge its vulnerability come from what you learn in the rapid resolution class plan. Uh, and so you've really got to coordinate what's going on in supervision and what's going on in resolution. And unfortunately, we don't have, other than FSOC, a very good institutional way of doing that. Well, the triage that would take place in the supervisory division, as it always does, will try to sort out the cities that are no problem, those that you maybe ought to worry about, and those that are headed for disaster. So far, most of the um, reform proposals have placed <coughs> primary emphasis and this so-called Basel III change, um, which they quite conscientiously refuse to call Basel III, but it's sort of Basel 2.4, um, makes a lot of emphasis on trying to raise the quantity and quality of capital. And by quality, they mean equity. And that's simply because I think all of the supervisors were in, in some sense really uh, embarrassed by the fact that they systematically announced that the banks they were closing had record high capital before in the last reporting day before. And what it meant, of course, was that their measure capital wasn't worth much. It had all sorts of inappropriate things in it, including especially deferred tax assets. Um, unfortunately, recent experience does not engender much hope that the capital will be useful. This is from the IMF. And it shows that the banks that were intervened actually held more capital than those that were not. Um, and all it means is that we're not very good at figuring out the appropriate <coughs> amount of capital relative to risk. Um, what are the higher capital ratios and, and where are they likely to be insufficient? Well, we've already had um, a mention of it, but let me just sort of go through it again. Uh, first of all, this can, as um, Let's see, I guess as Mervyn King said, and I, you had a much nicer way of quoting it, uh, capital can decline at an alarming rate in a crisis. We know that. Uh, and partly it's because it's based on accounting measures. And accounting conventions allow banks to conceal losses <coughs> in a whole lot of different ways. Uh, Lehman's 105 and 108 transactions are a very good example of it, but they're by no means the only example. There is a tendency, too, among supervisors, and I realize this is an awkward uh, forum in which to say it, but um, they often try to play for time because they have a very asymmetric payoff function. They get no credit for closing down an institution, but if they can delay it to somebody else's term, uh, that's a good thing. The, the best reward of a supervisor's life is a quiet life. Um, then the thin layer of equity may simply be overwhelmed by sudden uh, losses in a crisis. And I want to just remind you of how thin that layer of equity was. UBS and Deutsche Bank at one point were running 50 to 1. And to get through what we got through uh, with, you know, 40% volatility in markets with a 50 to 1 average either means that you were more than perfect or that you had a lot of help from your regulators that we don't know about. Uh, higher capital requirements, moreover, can lead to greater risk taking if they aren't perfectly calibrated with risk. And if there's one thing we've learned from the recent crisis is that we do not have the, the uh, um, ability yet, and I don't think we're likely to have it soon, to calibrate capital perfectly with risk. And so you're going to have regulatory arbitrage, and uh, CIFIs have, have time and again shown their ability to do this. Um, it was a particularly good example in the first attempt that the Basel Committee made to try to get rid of an obvious regulatory arbitrage problem. And that was that they had inadvertently put a lot of credit risk in the trading book by underweighting it in the banking book. So they tried to um, uh, increase the capital requirements against securitizations to uh, try to discourage them. And they raised them from 350% to 650% for double B minus, and triple A's were raised from 20% to 40%. It took only a week for the investment banking world to discover the re remic And the re remic enabled you to simply re-securitize your book of double B assets that would have cost you 14% tier one assets, 
into a securitized group that could produce 70% double A, and you'd pay the new higher percent on a much smaller proportion of double B, and if that didn't work out, you could actually resecuritize again. Uh, and in every case, you'd end up with a lower level of tier one capital than you did before. So I think the business of trying to cover up um, attempts for arbitrage is virtually useless <coughs> because in the end, we're stuck with this kind of problem. Regulation supervision is basically a continual contest between regulatees and uh, less well-paid, less well-informed regulators, and you end up with these kinds of discussions. This is, uh, take your pick, an investment bank or a lawyer said, these new regulations will fundamentally <coughs> change the way we have to get around them. And that's about the way the system works. Well, it strikes me that the failure of discretionary enforcement of capital requirements to curb bank risk taking suggests a need for automatic market-based <coughs> incentives. And Diane, I think, has done a nice job of talking about ooh, what those could be. <laughs> um, but most uh, of all, we need credible means of resolving cities. And I'm sorry, I misjudged my time. Um, this is something, uh, remarkably enough, that the G20 actually commented on in um, Pittsburgh. And um, we know them as all kinds of different things. They're, I guess, popularly known as living wills. Um, the British prefer the term recovery and resolution plans with a lot of attention to recovery. Uh, they're sometimes known as wine gun plans or more morosely as funeral plans. Uh, Section 165D of the Dodd Frank Bill requires that the Fed and the FDIC develop a resolution plan, a rapid resolution plan, but it's very light on details. And I'm going to be um, obnoxious enough to suggest what the details should be. Um, Rapid resolution should try to accomplish several different objectives. First and foremost, it should try to protect uh, taxpayers from the necessity of bailing out CIFIs. It should make clear to CIFIs and the market in general, and counterparties in particular, that no CIFI needs to be bailed out, that there is a credible means of bailing out, of, of resolving the CIFI without causing intolerable spillovers. It should force CIFIs and their boards to anticipate and internalize <coughs> some of the spillover costs that might occur. It should make the supervisor resolution authority aware of what it must be prepared to do in the event that things go wrong. And it should make the College of Supervisors, because most of these CIFIs are in fact <coughs> international institutions, um, and resolution authorities aware of what they have to do to minimize spillovers. Well, how do you get there? Um, in my view, the British approach of looking at recovery plans is, is sort of a diversion. Um, that's really what the bank ought to do. The focus ought to be on resolution, and it ought to start with the assumption that for whatever reason, the bank is insolvent. So what are you going to do about it? Well, first of all, they need to have uh, a current updated map that lists lines of business and, and puts them into corporate entities that have to be taken through some sort of bankruptcy process. The purpose and location of each separate en uh, entity has to be justified to the board and the supervisors, <coughs> And uh, at this point, I would say that uh, a, a tax reason is probably not going to make it. Um, must identify the key con interconnections across affiliates, and these can be financial interdependencies, and <coughs> at least as tricky, um, operational interdependencies, which are sometimes even more important, um, as we saw in the case of the wind down of, of Lehman. Um, they uh, also need to <coughs> maintain a virtual data room that contains all the information that an administrator or resolution authority would need to make an expeditious resolution. That means the location and methods used to maintain and record transactions, how daily reporting is used for monitoring and managing risk, specific risk exposures including products, sectors, counterparties, and countries, account numbers with settlement banks, businesses and crucial cutoffs, regulatory permissions, and business units carrying them out. Uh, lots of firms simply are not there. So this will be a very costly system to implement. On the same time, it's not a deadweight cost because firms should be there. Any well-run firm should know this about itself. And having the uh, regulators push them there, I think, is altogether a good thing. Uh, you've got to identify the key information systems, where they're located, um, especially in this era of outsourcing, and the essential personnel you need to keep them operating. 
those plans have to be made available to all the entities during the resolution process so they can figure out what their assets and liabilities are. And um, if outsourced, you've got to uh, demonstrate that the contracts are insolvency proof. Um, fifth, the CIFI must identify any activities or units it regards as systemically relevant. Uh, and demonstrate how the unit could continue to operate the fact, despite the fact that the entity that's operating currently goes under. Basically, you want to make them bankruptcy remote and easily transferable to some other institution that can keep them going. Um, the SIFI and, and systemic infrastructure must identify that how the SIFI can disconnect from all of the, the systemically important systems that they operate. That's actually very tough in today's wired world. How can you take a major player out with making the whole system crash? But that's a test that each and every system needs to make. Um, so that it would get knock on effects that way. The uh, SIFI must identify precisely the procedures it would follow in a rapid <coughs> resolution plan. Um, and um, that would include the whole sort range of, of details that just are often not spelled out. Hong Kong actually requires banks to do this but they've got to identify who's going to make the appropriate <coughs> notifications, who will in fact um, make the press calls, um, who will identify uh, your bankruptcy administrator, your lawyer, whatever you need to do to go through the system. And the rapid resolution plan must be updated either annually or if you've made a substantial acquisition that makes a substantial difference. Now, I think it's key to involve the board in this because in fact, when equity goes to just about zero, the board's fiduciary duty switches to <coughs> the creditors from the debtor. And if you don't have a viable resolution <coughs> plan, um, that is a dereliction of duty, frankly. Uh, it's as important to have a viable resolution plan as it has to have a business continuation plan. And it should be regulated that way. We've simply not looked at it in that way. Um, and so what you want is to have the regulators signing off on this the whole way down. I'm sorry, the board signing off on this the whole way down because they may well be held responsible. Uh, the primary supervisory resolution authority must examine the plan in detail, uh, certify the plan's feasible, and estimate the time it's going to take to wind down. If the plan's not uh, sufficiently swift or plausible, the regulator should be empowered to compel the SIFI to uh, redraft the plan. Uh, the SIFI may choose to simplify its corporate structure, which one hopes it would do, because there's no reason in the world to have 2,435 subsidiaries. Uh, improve its IT structure, infrastructure, which uh, has lagged at almost every one of these firms, partially because of the way they've grown, and uh, or to spin off activities that cannot be unwound without intolerable spillovers. Essentially, you want to make it very unpleasant to be a firm that is too big, too complex, or too interconnected to fail. Uh, the College of Supervisors and Regulators one more, um, must approve the wind-down plan or ask for changes, so you want to make sure it makes sense in the other key countries, um, and you'd like them to have them simulate the wind-down under varying stress conditions at least once a year, um, so that they understand what each of them is likely to which one is likely to ring fence, which one is likely to cooperate, uh, because that can be very, very tricky in a wind down situation. Um, basically, you would also like to confront the supervisors and regulators with the incentives they have inadvertently created to create such hideously complex structures, because in almost every case, it's some regulation or tax regulation that that causes banks to do these things. They're also simply regulatory arbitrage. Um, the top 16 SIFIs have 2.4 times more um, wholly majority owned subsidiaries than the top 16 non-financial firms. And that has to be attributed to regulation. Um, what are the potential benefits? Well, it's bound to reduce moral hazard. Um, in, uh, in fact, in the UK, as be, which is way out in front in trying to implement the system, Moody's openly warned them that they're going to have downgraded banks if they did it, uh, which is precisely what you want people to do, to assume what the bank will be able to do on its own, not with the help of, of the support system. It's going to cost SIFIs to simplify their corporate structure, 
and prepare plans to preserve um, some kind of better estate for the creditors. Um, and that would help a lot. Lehman has already lost more than <coughs> $75 billion for lack of any plan at all. It may cause the SIFIs to reduce their risk <coughs> exposures um, because at least they'll be aware of them and the board will too. And it will certainly help level the playing field between SIFIs and smaller, less complex institutions that are not operating off this massive safety net promise. There are private costs uh, and they're, they're, they're large. Um, one has to admit it. The compliance costs are going to go way up, but some of these costs are costs that these firms should have incurred anyhow. Um, and it may reduce the efficiency with which a SIFI can deploy its capital and liquidity, but these efficiencies may be private rather than public. It may be simply a matter of regulatory arbitrage or tax savings. Um, social costs, well, it could limit economies of scale and scope, but there's really little compelling evidence to um, believe that they exist much over $100 billion. And uh, there are other ways of getting there by having shared facilities, as with ATMs. Um, by reducing the cost, by reducing leverage, you will probably uh, increase the cost of intermediation, but that's probably justified, because that's what got us into this mess, having an over-intermediated society. Um, there are five reasons to be hopeful that it would have made a difference with our two biggest disasters, Lehman and AIG. One, the corporation would have adept, adopted less complex structures and might have taken less risk. Two, um, the COCOs that um, Diane talked about, some version of them, and the knowledge of a, a viable rapid resolution plan would have enhanced our market discipline. People who were looking at the bank would not have had the option of saying, oh, they'll be bailed out. Both firms crossed, and uh, it would have ensured the primary supervisor and the college of supervisors understood the challenge they faced in winding it down. Lehman actually had no organizational plan when it was wound down. Nobody knew how many different subs they had. And if the worst happened, we would have at least had a clear plan to follow in the bankruptcy. Uh, the key objective is that no bit, uh, SIFI should be too big or too complex or too interconnected to find. Uh, to fail or wind down. Government should never be forced into providing a bailout because of fear of creating a financial crisis. Basically, you want to get rid of the implicit blackmail that's going on all the time. Integration of regulation, supervision, and, and rapid resolution can protect the bank from this sort of blackmail. This is a note that says, I destroyed the, econo the economy once. Let me have my $1 million bonus, or I'll do it again. And, uh, that's the kind of problem we're up against now. Okay, uh, I'm going to approach this <coughs> from a little bit of a different angle given that um, I run a fund, have been involved in money management for 20 years. Uh, I'm going to look at it really from a practitioner's point of view. I think it's important to balance uh, against what might be a regulator or uh, an academic's point of view. And it's mostly what I'm going to focus on is the concerns of markets. What are people like myself that are in markets daily uh, thinking about what's occurred today and what we're worried about going forward? And I'll just consider myself the average reasonable money manager then. Um, simple definition of how we look at what systematic risk is. And it impacts the entire financial sector in a what can be a cascading contagion. Uh, and it's broader than just the financials. It could be natural disaster or terrorist attack. Uh, it could be emanating from the acts of central bankers, or it could be emanating from a large uh, failure. Probably financial failure is what we'd be most concerned about. And of course, what we've seen um, to date um, from September, forward really a lot of the elements of our definition of systemic risk uh, seem to be present and I think these are risks that um, institutions can't really protect themselves against and that's probably the proper purview uh, of, uh, of regulation. Um, I think that the, the arguments that are in my world that continue to this day are really what happened and what happens going forward and who's responsible for this and how do we deal with it. And the two arguments tend to be the market did it, 
or the government did it? The arguments of that the market did it, really that there were forces you know, in the economy that were beyond control or that, uh, that uh, uh, regulators did not have the power to deal with. And that systematic risk um, was market failure and that going forward there can be regulation to deal with that. Uh, the other side of this argument, and you'll find many people in the money management world think the latter, that the government was responsible and that the, the argument for that was really, um, uh, not to go into too much detail because I know we're a little light on time, that there were two aspects to it the uh, low interest rates, historical low interest rates that found its way into, that were existed in the markets from the last recession uh, going forward, uh, and unbalanced participation in the fixes that needed to be uh, made, whether it was uh, uh, letting Lehman fail, paying off creditors in some circumstances and not others, not following the rule of law as we understand it in, let's say, the price for bankruptcy. So the, the things that many market practitioners were worried about and continue to be worried about would be uh, reduced interest rates artificially and uneven handling of, uh, of uh, SIFI's failure, potential failure, and how creditors and interest are, uh, are, are paid. So just a couple of quick charts that we look at. I mean, if you see, this is, uh, so I'm sorry for the quality of that, but house prices versus the treasuries, you can see, some would argue that's not wholly, that one doesn't impact the other, but you know, from where we sit and many of the people in my business uh, see that low interest rates spiked uh, home prices. If you look at Fed funds rates, and this is really the, what this is really the, uh, the last recession right here, uh, yet the rates were managed low uh, going into 2004. In that period of time, this is sort of what we see as the, again, the way we look at it, the way we see this all played out. We had a world of wash and money looking to be put to work. Uh, Wall Street getting harangued by people in the U.S. and Europe and those with euro dollar, petrodollars, looking for triple A rated paper. So, Wall Street, hiring the best and the brightest theoretically, are put to the challenge. Client wants to buy triple A paper. Um, let's invent some triple A paper. Let's take people that might have once upon a time thought about being uh, biologists or chemists or, or philosophers and let's put them in a room and they'll invent something that we can call triple A. And you know, an easy example was, and I'd seen this early in my career, that there was auto back paper that uh, Chrysler and Ford and GM would bring. And the way that that paper was put together was you get 107% of par in underlying auto loans that would have a history of default. And the argument was this kind of, these kinds of cars, these kinds of regions, this kind of borrower, they default under 7%. You know, there's a 3% default rate. And over the period of time that you have this auto back paper, you've got a par piece of paper. You go to Moody's and S&P, you get a AAA rating, and that paper is now acceptable for a, a investment grade rated paper buyer. Using that analogy, Wall Street did what they were asked to do by clients looking for AAA paper. They saw an opportunity to take other asset classes, including mortgages, combine them, do the same kind of historical look back, you know, driving a car looking in a rear view mirror at default histories by region, by uh, type of borrower, by credit scores, by uh, dollar price of the, the loan. And uh, they created AAA paper. They bring to the rating agencies. The AAA paper starts getting snapped up. The rating agencies now have the moral hazard that they're getting paid fees to uh, <coughs> Uh, to rate this paper. This paper <coughs> is getting bought. There are no defaults. Rates remain low. 
people are able to make their payments. And so what you then have is this enormous mortgage-backed paper industry uh, held by a wide variety of investment-grade paper buyers. <coughs> uh, and that just feeds upon itself where pervasively low interest rates continue that cycle. People can make payments. There's less and less scrutiny because there's demand to buy that paper. Uh, and you get to the place where if you're watching the news, people like uh, Bank of America being accused in countrywide of essentially selling underwritten paper where the paper that's in those structured products don't meet the criteria they said. It's not, I don't think overt. I think that it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it was passively done. The mortgage underwriter is being told book more product. Uh, the mortgage underwriter calls Bear, Lehman, UBS, and says that the other firms are willing to take paper in this way. They take it, they write it, they sell it, everything's fine. Pretty soon there's this massive amount of paper out there. So in this whole period of time, uh, where we're seeing home prices skyrocketing, rates remain low. There was in the toolkit the ability to deal with interest rates. Again, this is what people in my line of work are saying, why weren't interest rates moderated then to deal with an asset bubble? So, you know, those that look back at it say that, you know, markets are going, there are going to be mistakes in markets, that's not systemic. And that in this instance, in this instance interest rates being managed artificially low uh, were a direct <coughs> cause uh, as global investors reach for yield uh, they're going to take on risks. Uh, maybe that's an unintended consequence of it. But the motivations of every part of this food chain says book more paper, take greater risk. Uh, and, and that's kind of how we get to where, uh, you know, you get to a place where the demand is so great that the documentation is terrible and ultimately there's a shock to a system and the bottom falls out of it. So like, where we sit again, the people who do what we do, what are we worried about? We're worried about perceived deficits and the growing debt at the federal government level. We're worried about sovereign uh, borrowing needs in the U.S. and abroad and how that can crowd out corporate borrowing. And are we going to be able to grow enough to deal with that kind of, of deficit? Uh, we're worried about the ability of the government to sell assets that it now has on its balance sheet. Um, we're worried about, I mentioned previously, we're very much worried about that when the government needs to come in and intervene in systems, in, in systemic <coughs> risk, in moments of systemic risk, that they do so in a way that's <coughs> uniform. I mentioned, you know, AIG, Lehman, Fannie Freddie, um, very different outcomes for different uh, crisis, or very different outcomes for people in comparable constituent classes in the cap structures of those businesses. So those that are participants in markets need to see something understood, uniform, that, it, that we can operate in markets knowing how we're likely to be treated. If there's questions about that, then what will happen is money comes out of the market and waits and doesn't come back in until it's comfortable. Um, there are the obvious things that people are concerned about, runs and liquidity. Some of the things discussed today may seem to make a lot of sense. Um, obviously runs can happen at couple institutions, but as we saw in CDS, the counterparties of fundamentally sound businesses can impact. And I think it's not I don't know if this is a popular point of view in my space or not. I would say that most people would agree that, for example, the CDS markets should be uh, regulated. That I know that when we look at situations, and my strategy is event-driven, uh, events include things like trouble. When we look at things like how, whether or not a bank will be able, uh, a company will be able to roll over its loans and refinance, one of the things that we have to game theorize are all the creditors in interest pursuing their rational financial interests? Is their financial interest really in the security that makes where they would rationally choose to work something out, or do they want a failure 
because this, they're really 10% in the senior part of the capital structure, but they're betting on fire <coughs> through CDS. And so here's a product that made perfect sense once that's being used really to place another bet. And take that to a, another extent. I didn't really think about this until the moment, but the wide variety of derivative instruments, the wide variety of ways in which people that do what I do can express uh, uh, an investment point of view are, are so broad that it's, it's not really clear how uh, when things go wrong, how that plays out. And I can think at May, this was May 7th was the flash crash, or the May 8th, I don't recall now. It's May 6th, thank you. I mean, I should remember it was an awful day. Um, but the things that we thought we had on to hedge our exposures included some ETFs that did not do for us what we anticipated. So uh, there's a wide variety of, of new ways to express risk that in market crises don't necessarily behave as they're expected to. And I, I think it, you know, we should avoid some of those things, but some things like CDS would, would probably be good to be on, a, on an exchange and, and, and looked at. Um, we've discussed a lot of these things. The thing, the thing that is, again, uh, that we are most concerned about uh, in asset bubbles it would be asset bubbles, and one of the things that we're concerned about now is the view that, uh, that the dollar is being managed lower and that rates will remain artificially low in a period where worldwide sovereign risk seems to have five-year average life. Uh, and um, I'm not saying that it isn't uh, the case that uh, there are those that would say we should do nothing and let the chips fall where they may. I'm not sure that that's a... Um, I'm not sure that that's a pleasant way to live a life, but I think that from a, a manager's, investment manager's point of view, if we can have some level of comfort about the rule of law and about how, uh, how regulation will be met and dealt, how uh, systemic risk will be dealt with, so long as it's uniform and understood, I think uh, there's a basis for participants in the market. I will say, over overall that most people that do what I do are somewhat negative and bearish over the next couple of years with 2.7 trillion of high yield uh, debt due 2011 through 2014 and with sovereign seeking uh, uh, financing at the same time uh, you're <coughs> going to see you know a pretty we think you'll see perhaps a rather large distressed cycle in corporate credit worldwide in the future. So long as money's there right now. What's interesting is we track the AMG figures, which are the inflows in the mutual funds, and money is finding its way to fixed income right now. And um, so for the near term, you know, I think it was Chuck Prince that said, while the music's playing, we keep dancing. But we are, we're very concerned about looking forward and, and would look for uh, regulation that would be uniform and well understood. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we do have a few minutes for questions. And uh, so if people have questions. Go ahead. All right, um, my question is um, to you, uh, uh, and I'm referring to the slide that you put up where you have your initial uh, marginal expected short was that this is divided into two groups of banks or institutions that needed need capital injections or not. So a bank like City had a, a statistic of 14.39, uh, uh, and it needed, of course, massive capital injection, where in the lower group <coughs> you had another higher statistic for like straight street corporation, which had like a 14.79, the highest correlative to, to City Group. So I was thinking about uh, this anomaly, and it could it be a result of the fact that you model uh, basically um, uh, in the model syste uh, systemic assessment uh, depends upon an optimal level of uh, bank capitalization, uh, mostly implying that the major source of systemic risk is equity capital. Now you do touch upon uh, or in incorporate in the model as well the uh, correlated exposures of of, uh, of bank of a bank. Uh, so. Is there, is there uh, an omitted dimension um, regarding the systemic correlations and the systemic implications of correlated exposures across banks and not within a single uh, institution? 
so that uh, maybe this um, dimension should be included when we're looking at the correlated exposures of across all these banks, and probably it would explain some of the discrepancies that we've seen in the statistics. Yeah, no, that's a good observation. Uh, so I, I guess three quick things. One, uh, you know, this is a statistical measure, so it will have some sampling error associated with <coughs> it. So, we, we probably wouldn't expect everything to line up perfectly. Uh, I think uh, two, even though State Street's uh, mess is high, its leverage is much smaller than Citigroup's. Citigroup's leverage at the time we look at it was over 100 is to 1 because most of their market cap was lost. Uh, so I think that would be a big factor. And the third point is that uh, also Citigroup's losses are understated in the SCAP because losses that they would have suffered on the Fed-backed assets were not included in their shortfall. So I think Citigroup, my priors are if it had been treated like Bank of America so that all of their assets were subjected to stress test for the shortfall calculations, probably Citi's shortfall might have been pretty large, uh, maybe even larger than that of Bank of America. Other questions? Yes. Um, without being, I'm not too familiar with the measures. It strikes me that that market-based measures of systemic risk is, in some sense, an oxymoron. Um, that that in a world where the market is failing, flash crash, for example, um, the measures are also going to fail. Uh, am I wrong about this? Is there is there some is there a, maybe maybe the panel could comment on the relationship? between the balance of market-based measures and non-market-based measures. Maybe that's my question. Carol, why don't you start, and then I'll have yeah. the other panelists comment after your comment. Uh, yeah, in a way, you know, if the, so basically what the me measure relies on is the property that if you, that what you see happening in the sort of like the local tail can be extrapolated to what's going to happen when you get <coughs> something that's sort of very massive. Uh, and as I said, so one big error that could arise is if you don't account for leverage. <coughs> so prior to the crisis, pretty much everyone has reasonably, reasonable, the, pretty much everyone has small shocks. You know, so the mess measure is quite small for everyone. But the fact that Bayer has a leverage of 25 is to 1 is quite important in extrapolating that if you had a much m massive market correction, Bayer is going to lose a lot more market cap than, say, J.P. Morgan, for example. Uh, I think where uh, the measure, according to me, does poorly uh, is in things like AIG, for example, where you know uh, it's basically selling a ton of deep out of the money options, and the point at which so it could even when when you get local shocks, which are not too bad, maybe the demand for this insurance actually goes up and AIG stock price actually increases because it's going to be collecting premiums by selling these insurances. And it's only when you get a truly <coughs> massive tail shock that actually you see the true tail exposure of AIG. So I didn't get time to show it, but now if you look at the credit default swaps data, for example, that's a lot better for uh, this because the CDS of AIG is a contract on default risk of AIG. It's not actually a contract on local tail. The CDS of AIG is a contract on, C uh, on AIG defaulting. Now, the trouble with CDS is though is that one, it's not available for a, lot, a large number of financial firms out of our top 100 financial firms, it's available only for about 50. Uh, and two, uh, you worry about the CDS a lot more uh, from the standpoint of government backstop than equity, because uh, even where there were some backstops, I think equity did take a much larger hit than unsecured creditors did. Yeah. But I think I, I, I'm sort of sensitive to your concern. From what we are seeing, it appears that in the cross section, you can still pick up quite a lot. So it could be that the level of risk premium is not right in the economy as a whole. But the market was telling you that Bear and Lehman were actually more risky than other financial firms 
even in the three or four years building up to the crisis. Anything else want to comment? Um, I think you also have to think about which markets actually kept going during the crisis. And there were precious few of them that didn't interrupt or sort of fall apart. Um, the flash crash is certainly a major concern, but if you're looking for what the market thinks about a firm, you really should be taking a long run average over time. And if you looked at the decline of major banks from their previous peak, if you picked a number like a 40% decline, you would have picked out all of the banks that got in trouble, and that included AIG. Um, it was seen in the market, even though there was an argument they were making profits off of it. Uh, and so there was really no excuse for the government to be enormously surprised and come in over a weekend in a panic and try to uh, figure out a resolution. There really were indicators that, that should have told them a long time ago that if their supervisors could not, the market could tell them who to worry about. Yeah, I think it's the, I think the regulatory capital is extremely slow moving, I think as Diana was highlighting, and because it's partly it's book based, partly it could have some distortions because, you know, it's the housing asset which is performing the worst, but we actually have the lowest capital weight on those AAA tranches. And so, uh, it, almost everyone looked so well capitalized on regulatory basis, uh, I think that might have created a sort of more of a confusion as to what was happening to them. But if you look at equity price movements or CDS price movements, they were actually looking worse for those firms which actually hit the ground first. What it did was create a lot of cynicism about regulation. Yeah. And, you know, every time it happened, it made you wonder if the regulators had any idea what was going on. Anybody else want to comment? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Some of the, the, the concerns I've heard expressed here in the example <coughs> from the presentations I've seen really focus on U.S.-based financial institutions. But if you look globally, the largest financial firms now include many institutions that are not U.S. institutions, RBS, UBC. So what kind of concerns do you all have for systemic risk to the U.S. system from these foreign institutions that now have increasing presences, not only worldwide, but here in the U.S. Well, um, so, so I think that, you know, part of the coordination um, of both the Basel Supervisors Committee, the Financial Stability Board, the G20, is to, you know, both create an increase in these various metrics, you know, that we talked about, such as, you know, capital, contingent capital, resolution plans, you know, there, there needs to be a coordinated uh, effort. And in part, that's because, you know, if one country increases their standards and others don't, there is this feedback across um, countries. I, I do think, though, mm -hmm. that having higher standards in the U.S., actually means that we become like a, a place of strength, right? And, you know, it's not necessarily bad for U.S. organizations to have high capital standards and those sorts of things. I think, you know, people, you don't want to focus so much on the level playing field that you miss that you, you haven't solved the problem. I, I worry more about um, having been involved in owning and being short financial institutions. Uh, I'm much more worried that I, you know, what's the expression there are the known unknowns, the unknown unknowns. I kind of feel like, you know, European banking institutions are unknown unknowns right now. I have a hard time getting to a point where I feel like I understand what their assets look like and what their liabilities look like. And the consequence is that's causing them to pay on the capacity premium in the market. And so if there is some hope for convergence, and I don't put a lot of hope on it, but if there is some, it's that the banks themselves are perceiving uh, an advantage in being more transparent than they have been. Although you can talk to a Japanese bank and they'll say, 
the only right way to deal with all of this is just to have a bailout policy so that you bail everybody out and nothing gets to play. And uh, there is a diversity of views within even the G7, let alone the G20. Yes, add, uh, so one of the reasons why you know our measure is somewhat overly simplistic at some level. It only relies on stock market data, very simple, level <coughs> that's nice, is that you can then extend it easily to other countries and do some comparison. So currently we are looking at European and Australasian firms. You do need to worry about accounting differences to get that leverage right and so on, but at least it's feasible uh, and that lends, uh, you know, you can sort of put firms on a similar uh, metric even if the metric may not be as sophisticated as I believe. Incidentally, one of the worrisome things about Basel II is that it has made it virtually impossible to compare risk-weighted capital across countries because European countries have 168 different options for deciding how to apply it. And unless you know precise details about how each bank did it, you don't have a clue. So it sort of pushes everybody back toward a pure equity standard. And uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. Yeah. I have a question for Mr. Lupo. You mentioned that uh, system market risk is not systematic risk. And you also mentioned that uh, the important systematically important firms. I wonder how, in practice, how do you really define these as systematically important firms? Do you refer to the financial firms or the general firms? Well, um, as, as was said earlier by someone and I, I one of my uh, strategies includes a distress um, periodically from 1990 to the present you have industries uh, that are in decline and you know in you know supermarkets and department stores failed in 90 and 91 it didn't really I don't think that it was it was a huge default cycle and it wasn't systemic uh, you saw um, uh, let's see, what else did we see? We saw um, uh, real estate companies and holding companies in 97, 98. Uh, we saw uh, in various times the dot-com world. The dot com world, the steel, steel, auto. I mean, well, auto corresponds with some of what we're seeing now. But those industries can fail and doesn't really create systemic risk. Um, I think that the point made about highly complex organizations with interdependency, that's something that we recognize as a, 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 an institution that is a, a, a that I, I, we look beyond just, you know, a, a bank, a large financial institution and understand how it interacts with others in markets. And I think, you know, with derivatives, I think that, that the reason we'd like to see that perhaps be um, on, an, on a, an exchange is that that can give greater transparency about interdependence as well. All right, one last question. This is for the entire panel, but if you can care to comment on sort of three anecdotes or stylized facts from the crisis. Um, one was the Danish mortgage position that yeah, where cash was not really the problem, payments was not really the problem, the market market, because they were 90, 95% of that market, that when we had problems here in the States, all of a sudden the market market on Danish, CEO, uh, Danish uh, super seniors really gapped out and started causing problems for them on a market market trader. So to sort of speculate on how that might impact some things. Uh, second, uh, observation or anecdote would be the relationship between things like sec lending and repo, uh, possibly having a confound with CES uh, problems uh, in the same market. So collateral fails and repo from the same institutions. Uh, you know, I can think about there are people that you ordinarily wouldn't be systemically important becoming systemically important because they're big holders of bonds or they're big sec lending counterparties. And then the third component would be some of the challenges we face or would face putting heterogeneous over-the-counter derivative market product derivative instruments onto a, an exchange where exchanges are really sort of better suited for standardized contracts.
um, you know, with all the sort of variation around swap settlement dates and a lot of those other features that are fairly customized. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, let's see what I want to tackle uh, either mark to market uh, transmission through uh, collateral concerns or exchanges. Yeah, maybe I'll just uh, mention something on the repo markets. Uh, I, I tend to agree. I, I think that so, in the recently passed legislation in the US, the Dodd Frank Act, uh, uh, one of my concerns is that it's, it's very focused on institutions. So it's focused on identifying individual institutions as SIFIs. But sometimes there's a collection of contracts and a co collection of small institutions uh, which are actually systemically important. So one example is money market funds. Probably no individual money market fund is very large, but collectively they are about $5 trillion of deposits. I think repo financing is on same order of magnitude. It's overnight. It looks very much like collateralized but demandable debt. <coughs> and so uh, by, by I agree that it's important to focus on SIFIs, uh, I think that we need to also extend the resolution principles uh, more broadly to things like repo market. Suppose there's a repo run. How are we going to resolve uh, a repo run in future? How, how do you unwind from a repo contract when many institutions are withdrawing all at once? I, I think it's a very important systemic risk issue that needs to be tackled going forward. Maybe it needs either an emergency repo bank or it needs uh, some sort of a resolution mechanism designed to deal with repo contracts when it happens. You know, I, I'd agree. Um, I think we saw with Lehman's failure that, uh, uh, was it, uh, it is a reserve fund that broke the buck, and, and it suggests that da a daily liquid instrument could have a run. Um, definitely some reason to be concerned. I'd like to say a word in favor of the Dennings. <laughs> they uh, um, had a real estate bubble that was at least as bad as ours. They have a <coughs> much simpler real estate system that is based on mortgage bonds and is the only other system in the world I know of that delivers the same benefits ours does. You can get a 30-year fixed rate mortgage with zero repayment penalties. Um, despite the fact that a lot of our bigger institutions were playing with, with derivatives on it, it actually sustained, uh, it, went, it kept going throughout the crisis and uh, the Danish system did not suffer all of the consequences we're going through now. Part of it is because a person, they, you continue to personally guarantee your, your, your mortgage as, as opposed to non recourse. Partly, but it, it, it's um, also a fact that they did not let lending standards decline in the same way that we did because you had a much better disciplined system in place. It's much simpler, it was, it was <coughs> transparent, and it makes one wonder why we went through such incredible complexity to produce more or less the same thing. All right, I think uh, we're going to close this session. Thank you very much, and thanks to our panelists.